Book 2025. We're here on the third day of our exhibition and conference, and it's been a great time the last three days. We've had uh, Minister Gobin on, on Wednesday, and then Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim coming here yesterday, and um, Prime, uh, Minister Gobin here back again. It's been really hectic, lots of people, lots of discussion. It's been really fun. And uh, here with me uh, this afternoon is Dr. Non Ar Kara. Ar Kara. From Thailand. Yes. yes. Thailand. From the Digital Economy Promotion Agency of Thailand. Commonly known as DIPA. DIPA. Yeah, DIPA. <laughs> That's fine. That's fantastic. And I understand your work is around data and uh, data interoperability, mm. which means data sharing mm. and bringing kind of, you know, breaking data out of silos mm. uh, in order to make cities better, cities smarter. Right. Can you elaborate a little bit about your work so that our audience will understand your work? Definitely. So first of all, we want to collect data because we want to make better decisions. Okay. Well, when we have better decisions, we can do a lot more. Right. So for instance, uh, I almost uh, missed my flight to come over here because I use my belief and my familiarity with my area around my house is that it's not so far from the airport. I can I can go there within half an hour. But it turns out that uh, there was a traffic jam. There was a car accident. So <laughs> had I opened my, my map, Absolutely. which is free, by the way, yes. I could have seen that hey there's a traffic jam I should not be uh, taking a taxi I should be taking a sky train yeah. and I would have not missed my flight right so in the sense uh, we have data now and the, the data are very very good in terms of helping us making better decisions so in, in the grand scale, scheme of things and come to, to cities imagine if you have a uh, data on roads uh, you have data on traffic you have data on waste management yep. and you lay, layer them up so the uh, trucks that are collecting trash wouldn't come out when the traffic is bad yes right or that, that, that if you people know uh, when the traffic is bad they would use different routes yes. right Things like that would actually help uh, us making better decisions and get us to places we want to be better, and then we can use our labor and time for, for things that are matter to us more. Absolutely, I think I think definitely. You know, there was an age before we had Google Maps and mm. and, and Waze, right? You remember where, that those days? Those days. So long ago, right? Where on one hand you never had a, you know you, you you could get stuck in traffic jams, yeah. but we also had less cars those days. <laughs> right. <laughs> Today we have a, a lot more cars, more cars. That's how we need to use that. Exactly. But that's a great example, you know. Can you give us more other examples of how mm. technology and data could mm. help us have better cities? Definitely. And uh, I heard that you spoke to one of my heroes, uh, Mayor Kanop Chad, yesterday yes. Right, yes. from the Konsi Tamara. That's our model smart city. So <clears throat> what the mayor did um, was fascinating. So pretty much uh, he realizes that if you want to solve one problem, which has been haunting the city for a long time, flooding he would have to spend lots of money on infrastructure, physical infrastructure like waterways, uh, underground uh, water infrastructure and so on, that's expensive. And usually it takes forever to get the funding from the government, uh, and then you have to do procurement, it takes a long time, and then con con construction itself also takes a long time. So uh, at the end, when, when you have a problem like flooding that happens every year, people leave the city. Yep. Investment would want to come in. Nobody want to build infrastructure hubs, or we already want to build a manufacturing hub in a city flood every year. Sure. So, so what happened was that he didn't want to wait. He started to find. He started by trying to find out with data what are the real problems of flooding. Right? Is it about infrastructure, or is it about trash in the waterways? Was it about uh, you know, the, the the problem with the the sink uh, the, the sinking of, of the of the soil? So it turns out that after we look into the problems, it turns out that the problem is actually have to do with how waterways are getting con constantly clogged. Right. right. By because of people who are didn't know what to do with their trash, that sometimes the trees for their houses throw into the waterways. Yep. Refrigerator sometimes you found in the waterways. Wow. Right. So then we realize that well, first of all, we have to manage uh, the systems that, that help taking trash away from the people better. Right. That would be one of the the, the way to solve it. The other thing is that how do we unclog the waterways? Yeah. Uh, one of one of the the things that we had in mind was to install digital cameras everywhere just to see uh, which of the places that water is a cl uh, waterways are clogged, so that we can go unclog there. But turns out cameras are also expensive. Right. And yep. you can't put cameras in, in, in everywhere. Everywhere, absolutely. Right. It's privacy issues, also cost ineffectiveness and so on. So what we did was that uh, we, in, in, con in con uh, consultation with the mayor, uh, decided that we want to turn every citizen into our cameras. Yes. Right? All they had to do uh, was to go around and look and see a problem, snap a picture. And we designed it's an app. rubbish or something there. Exactly, yeah. right? So they have a picture. To, when they send a picture to us, that picture is a gold mine, right? Because yeah. when you have a digital picture, there's a metadata, right? Yeah. So we know exactly the location of that place. We know exactly the, the time that it was taken, not last year, not a year ago, right? And we also know exactly uh, from which of the devices has been taken, whether or not it was AI generated. So all these sure. things were really useful. Yeah. So we extract the data, yeah. we put it into into a, an AI system, you know, not even advanced one, the one that kind of helped us automate the, uh, the pr prioritization. Of, of the problems and at the end we have a map with a heat map showing where the critical problems are in the city 
right? And then what we have to do uh, after that was easy because in, in the past we sent trucks to different places randomly. Sometimes you find problems, sometimes you don't. But now with the pinpoint of, of, of the data we can get from aggregations of data from, our, from all the people that act as camera for us, we know exactly which are the areas that have been ver verified, not only from the people that sent photos to us, but also from some of the sensors that we in install and also from some of the previous historical um, data that we know that these are the problems that, that ha happened in the past. So we've been ag uh, aggregated in, 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 in different layers. We see exactly where the problem are, and that's usually about 80 to 90 percent accuracy. So Fantastic. with that, we can send all the trucks to where it matters most, and lo and behold, uh, the, it hasn't flooded for many years. Wow, that's fantastic. Right. I think people really feel happy when they see, when they participate in solving the problem, right? Exactly. It gives them a more, a higher sense of ownership over their own city. Exactly. The fact that they can make a difference. Exactly. And I suppose the fact that the council is really responsive to the issue. Uh, you know, in some places we kind of make a complaint and then nothing gets done. Exactly. Where in this case, it's actually getting done. Exactly. Then you know why? Because uh, there is incentive structure within the app. Okay. Yeah. So for instance, if you imagine you are the staff, you are the one driving trucks to unclog waterways. Yeah. You used to get about three problems a day. But now with this uh, system and processes, you get 300. Would you want to work that much because you, your salary is going to be the same, right? Yep. So the mayor was genius. Uh, he decided that he wanted to uh, push it back to the citizen. So if the citizen see a problem and have a picture and the staff go and fix the problem, the citizen themselves would be the one who give the star to okay. the, the staff. Okay. And at the end of the year, who get the most number of stars, get promoted. Wow. Right? Wow. And so incentivize all these people to actually click accept the problem faster than Grab, <laughs> faster than any ride hailing services, right? <laughs> because you incentivize people in the right way. So when the staff are incentivized in the right way, they want to work harder. When the people are incentivized in the right way because they see problems getting solved really faster and effectively, they want to use their word of mouth to spread uh, the effectiveness of, of the app to other people. And at the end, we get a better city. People who left the city because of flooding, they are coming back. Investment that left the city because of flight, they're coming back. So now the socio-economic structure of the city are, are improving. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is a really good example. It's not just about the technology, but incentivizing citizen part, uh, part, uh, participation. Exactly. And in, in, incentivizing those who actually provide the solution. Right? Yeah. So it's about thinking, how do we actually make the best use of technology, not mm. just technology by itself. That's, I couldn't frame it better than what you just said. Yeah, that's yeah. really fantastic. Yeah. So I think, I think uh, you know, if you, if you look outside and you look, say, Global South, right? Mm. We still see a lot of issues, uh, you know. Many uh, cities in the Global South are still, you know, dirty, uh, are still clogged, mm. traffic jams. You know, what, what's a good first step? I mean, it would be fantastic if we can have a mayor, you mm. know, like Dr. Knob, right? But not all our cities have such a mayor. Right. What, what's a good first step? How do citizens think about the problem given the fact that all these technologies is mm. coming into our cities? Right. Well, the, the last thing that we wanted to see happening was that people take it into their own hands, yeah. right? Because they are paying tax. Yeah. It should be the government, the local government, who actually solve the problem on behalf of the citizens. But then sometimes, as you can, as, as you just mentioned, sometimes cities are not lucky. Right? Not not all the cities are born equal. Not all the cities have mayor like American Nope. So what happened is that sometimes we have to empower the people to actually think about what they can do, right? So in some places where the socioeconomic structure of the cities are, are, are dilapidating, we can encourage the people to be the one who actually. Uh, put together their efforts into into doing something that, that matters to them. So, if for, for instance, there are many areas in Bangkok, for instance, that uh, people will actually uh, pull their resources together to promote their areas in order to bring in the, the economy, bring in tourism, and then they are the ones who actually become eyes on the streets, watching out for each other in terms of criminal activities and, of course, in terms of waste management. So, at the end, when the government starts to realize that, hey, the people are doing it uh, without our help, and then who, why, why are we not doing anything? They started to, to come in and and, and play a role that they're supposed to be playing from the beginning, but then they didn't, right? So in a sense, there are the, the way to push the government to do more uh, by way of citizen doing first, but I don't think that should be the way to go. I think the government first should be the one, should be the one who think about what kind of framework uh, that we should have. And I think the most important word to, for, for me when, when as answering the questions that you have here is that is the purpose. Right? If we have a unified purpose, then you can desiloize everything. Yeah. Right? But right now, the purpose of different agencies and different local government units are not the same. Right? One, one might say, I, I need to take care of trash, and then period. So if, if, uh, if the trash is gone, I'm happy. But if trash happened to be in the water, I, I don't see it. That's not my problem anymore. Right? Or sometimes, I'm just only to fix roads. I don't care about whether or not uh, roads leads to other problems in terms of pedestrian wall. I don't care anymore. So these are the things that are, are actually making things uh, uh, siloized and therefore not operable. The way we wanted it. But if the purpose uh, that was uh, given by the mayor or the decision maker of the city is clear that, hey, we 
wanted to make the city more livable. And livable means more convenient, more uh, comfortable, uh, give them more chances of, of getting job opportunities. And at the end, the ecological structure of the cities are actually nice for people to live in. If that is the unified goal, then a lot of, of agencies underneath will, will follow suits. But if the KPIs are different, then there's no way that they can come together and then decide that they want to work on, to, on something together. Because if you have different K K K KPIs, your KPI is not going to be as important as mine. Yeah, so I think what I hear from you is that you know, a uh, um, you know, sense of belonging and uh, participation, and if the citizens take action, mm. uh, uh, their action in a way sometimes could even embarrass the government. The government is not taking action. Right? Exactly, um, exactly. So they give an incentive for the government to say, look, okay, we also have to buckle up. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have a very active uh, citizenship uh, taking part. I think that was your first point. Mm. The second point you mentioned is that how do you align those KPIs mm. so that um, departments don't see their work in silos. Right. They exactly. actually do, you know, feed into a bigger picture. Right. Uh, you know, not just being rewarded on, on, on one specific. Area. Exactly. So, for example, in some countries, mm. uh, they decided that the KPI is to is to decrease uh, carbon emission from internal combustion engines. Yeah. Right. So if you talk to Ministry of Transport, they will be talking about how do we uh, get people to adopt EV. Right. If you talk to people from the Department of Forestry, they say, well, how can we plant more trees? Yes. Right. <laughs> but then there's many countries, actually, in Eastern Europe, that actually op uh, opened up their, their, their public transport system for people to use for free. Because when that happened, people are prone to use public transport more and leave their cars or more. Carbon emission goes down. So without, more, without having to build more trees, which is kind of nice if you have, but if you don't have budget for that, I mean, no, no, not, not many people are using you know, internal combustion engine cars anymore because they are able to use public transport for free, right? So in, in places whereby KPIs are, are completely different, they're not going to lower their guards. But in places where they actually say KPI is about lowering number of cars, then maybe public transportation could help in terms of uh, carbon emissions as well. So I think if we can cross mm -hmm. uh, our KPIs that way mm -hmm. and have a unified goal, we can actually do less but gain more because we can actually be innovative about the way we approach problems. Yeah, that's a very good example. Yeah. Definitely, I think I'm all for free public transport. <laughs> exactly, right? right. Yeah. And the, the money that, that pay for free public transport could be the money from the, uh, the other pockets that would be used for other things, right? And then, and then at the end, you get the same result. The same result, yeah. yeah. So I understand you have a background in, in architecture, in anthropology, yeah. and digital policy. Mm. So you really have a kind of an interdisciplinary approach to, to look at this. Mm. Can you share us a little bit about you know how these different types of knowledge that you mm. have experienced mm. kind of comes together in terms of how you look at these, these problems. Sure. Well, first of all, I was a horrible architect. That's why I, <laughs> I quit being an architect. I, I was a horrible one. I, I, did, I went to MIT for a, my, a degree in architecture, uh, but I was an embarrassment to my alma mater. So I quit architecture and I, because I realized that architects like to build Yes. Because that's how we get paid. That's right. right? If you don't build, you don't get paid. Exactly. Yeah. But sometimes, uh, not building is better than building. Right. right? That's I mean, also a good point. You can see some some area and be like, well, I actually want to make this area better as 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 is, rather than tear it down, build something up. But then we don't get paid if we recommended that. Right? And that's how I can no longer be an architect because I make that suggestion all and the time. that's your anthropological perspective of the issue. Well, but I, I, I did that even before I have a degree okay. in anthropology. And that's why I was an odd one out uh, in architecture because I didn't want to build anything. Anymore. I wanted to make whatever is already there better. So I found out that if I wanted to do that, I need to study more about people. Right? So I need to do, to do more about psychology, I need to learn more about anthropology, and sociology, and human sciences, behavioral economics. And these are the things that are, are pretty much started from the field of anthropology. Right? Once we study people deeply, not, not like going there and then shallowly look, looking at uh, what's happening and then come back and write a report, but more like spending time with them. Right. I, when I was a, a student in anthropology, I spent months uh, in, in Manila, for instance, in the squatter settlements, trying to understand what is it that makes people not wanting to move away from this. Right? And then I realized that it's really not about space, it's about income. So even, even if we build better, a bigger space for them, they're not going to move either. They might even subdivide their spaces to rent out and then they become more congested. It's really about income. So how can we make their, their, their income uh, more than, than before? So that has, has become the, the tenets of my, of my work uh, for the past few years. Like how, first of all, do we incentivize people? 
because as I mentioned earlier, uh, humans are weird, right? We don't do things just because it's good. We do things if it has the direct incentives to our well-being sure. right now, yeah. right? Not not in the near future, not in many years from now, yeah. right now. Yeah. So how do we actually incentivize people to do that? And that's psychology, that behavioral economics, right? How do we understand the collective incentives, that anthropology? How do we understand the larger realms of the domain of societal operation? That's sociology. Yes. And that's the reason why I decided that maybe I should be more so like social scientist than architect. That's how I bring them, them together. And now smart city seems like that area that I, I could build up my profile and then I can help people in, in, in trying to become smart city expert. Right? You can see my, my back shirt here, right? Smart city officer. Smart city, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I give this shirt to everybody who, who actually uh, passed my course. Ah, uh, yeah, fantastic. and I designed it myself, you know, just ven ventilation here for nice. Asian, nice. Uh, heat and there's a hood here for, for <laughs> India, right? Because I think at the end of the day, we need interdisciplinary uh, feel for people who want to make city better. It cannot be urban planner anymore because urban planners think about roads from economic standpoint. It cannot be architect because architect thinks about physical infrastructure only. It cannot be anthropology because anthropology maybe just want to keep it the way it is. So we have to bring everything in, uh, bring in standards, bring in the deep understanding of culture, bring in the integrated knowledge about society, bring in the personal stories so that we can tell stories that matters and people are convinced by. Fantastic, fantastic. So I really hear you on, you know, not just taking a standard architectural or urban planner perspective. It's actually bringing in society, kind of taking an anthropological, sociological view. Mm. I kind of really try to figure out what kind of policies will work. So I think you're, you know, what I'm hearing from you in terms of smart cities is that it's just not about the technology, it's just all these other areas that you've got to think about in order to make smart cities really inclusive and really serve the city. I mean, three years ago, I was about to quit my job uh, because when I was hired many years ago, I was hired to do policy. And I had a really nice corner office in Bangkok, by the way. And I was writing my policy in this air-conditioned air corner office for three years and nothing actually happened. So I, told, I went to my boss and said, can I quit my job because this is not, it, not for me anymore. I don't see any results. And then my boss was like, well, Nan, I forgot that you have a PhD in anthropology. Why don't you move yourself from policy writing to working in the field? Mm. And I did that during a pandemic time. And mm. turns out, you know, I flipped Fantastic. the script. Yeah, Fantastic. that's what happened. Fantastic. Anyway, thank you so much for having uh, joining us thank today. You so much. I think our audience really learned a lot from you know, all your insights and you know, the stories I'm hearing from Thailand are fantastic. I hope Malaysia can keep up. And uh, no, we are looking bit. up to Malaysia too. <laughs> so, like, you know, let's work together. I think uh, we have we don't have time anymore to reinvent any wheels. Sure. Right. If anything that you are doing great, you know, give it to us. If, if we're doing anything great, we give it to you. I mean, let's do that because that's the spirit of ASEAN of absolutely. humanity as a whole. Absolutely. Actually, absolutely. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. A little bit more about smart cities and how we take a kind of a holistic view into making smart in this work. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I'll just wrap up with a couple of seconds. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's good. It's good. Uh,